What's going on, everybody? Today I want to talk about a book I just read, The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. So I've been covering a lot of financial stuff, but if you look back through the history, I talk about really anything I find interesting, and I think this is important ideas and, and things for any human to read, right? We're all omnivores, and we don't think very much about where our food comes from anymore. That's one of the main things to take away from this book. It's called, uh, like I said, The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals. So he goes through and breaks down how, uh, or to the best he can, the process of how four meals are made. And there is a lot of interesting things that go on in our food system that we are no longer very aware of anymore. So the first one is corn, really, and it's, it's incredible how corn has really taken over uh, what we eat as a whole and how important it has become to the industrial uh, system. So he starts off his adventure in, adventure, <laughs> and, uh, in the cornfields, you know, and looking how all these things are produced. And, I mean, it's crazy to read about all, all the ways that our food production is subsidized and things like corn are subsidized, right? I knew some of these things, but, it, it, I mean, to go into more detail and just read how, like, blatantly, basically, the USDA is, I would say, corrupt. You know, they're a corrupt agency and they cater to the needs of large industrial players. So I didn't expect that of the uh, USDA. I knew there was problems, but I didn't realize how much it was encouraged by our own government. And, you know, different food practices, even like how we store food or how it's dealt with, because, I mean, there is some need for some government oversight because you don't want to run out of food, right, for a whole population. That's one of the most important things. And But how you manage how the prices are and the storage of this food is handled really changes how things go. And really the subsidies to all the farmers now that they have to get is not just the benefit of the farmers. Everyone knows the farmers are struggling like <laughs> almost like never before, right, with the amount of debt they take on. Really the companies have been profiting, the ones who make the equipment, who sell them the seeds, like things like that with Monsanto and things like that. So it goes into a lot of these details, how corn has taken over basically our food system and how we have taken this sort of reductionist mindset to our food and in this way we break it down into the, what we what we need and then we kind of reformulate our food based around that. And it's a very interesting commentary of our system. And, you know, I can understand why some people are, you know, a little bit more libertarian like uh, Joel Salatin discussed later in this book. So that's the first big part of this book about how corn has really taken over our society, mainly, you know, enabled by the U.S. government, the way that they go through it, the administrative USDA, uh, subsidies and all things like that. Then it goes and tackles into organic, big organic, which is really interesting because there's so much like uh, this pastoral like uh, idealism that you see on organic packaging, but that's not really true for how the big organic runs now. And they run in a pretty industrial uh, way. Obviously, there are some, there are benefits to organic, right? Not saying that, and basically that's what the book concludes too, is that, I mean, it, it's better than the regular food there seems to be more precaution there seems to be some better nutrients in the foods like that too some of it can be debated but overall i mean it seems like the practices are better but the thing is they're still trying to fit uh, that into an industrial system it's like some of the players don't even care right they're just regular food producers and then they they think that that's a market niche they can fill organic they go for it so again that's really interesting to read and i didn't realize how much uh, marketing played a role into the organic sales when you see a picture you know of a cow grazing on grass it's like or for the chickens it was like they have access to grass it's kind of funny though because they still do it in an industrial way so the chickens are all stuffed into a place right and they're not allowed to use all of the uh, traditional things and all these antibiotics and things like that so the animals are prone to getting sick why because they're not in a good natural system they're still an industrial way that this is the chicken this is the product i'm going to make this product and <laughs> that's how it's going to go, right? So, oh, I'm just checking my mic was on. <laughs> I thought it wasn't on for a second. And what happens is you have animals that are really susceptible to a bunch of diseases. So when they have, they say that it's, uh, it could be free range or whatever, it could be that they live in you know, this stuffed compartment and then after fi they're five weeks old, they can finally go outside because then they won't be so contaminated, but by the time they're five weeks old, they're still used to their indoor setting, 
they'll never venture into the grass. So they'll really never even be on grass, even though you could say, uh, you know, certain things in your packaging like that. Like, so uh, pretty misleading in, in some ways. Again, it's like it's the animals are treated slightly better. It's like all of it's like slightly better, uh, and even more so for the plants. Like the 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 way the plants are raised actually tend to be better for organic, but it's like right it's taken this idea that the original idea behind organic and it's distorted it right into become industrial and fit our society and fit the needs of supermarkets supermarkets want large orders they don't want to have to organize with so many suppliers right then we get to Joel Salatin which is really really interesting guy i've watched other stuff with him and i've you know read other things about him before and i'm you know really interested in his methods and he has a much different perspective on uh, raising everything and he has really adapted things to the natural system uh, it's funny because i said libertarian because he just he is like he's kind of crazy right but he describes himself as like you know a christian libertarian uh you know he he, he, has, he likes to use a bunch of adjectives um but he has really interesting practices right and i think anyone can agree that they're sustainable uh, i'll go over it slightly quickly but just as an example kind of what his farm does is he really tries to complete the natural system and look at how it goes in nature and imitate that in the same way. So he has a forest um, on the northern slope of his farm, right? And that helps protect the farmland and keep everything in there. And just like things like that you don't think of, right? You think you don't need the forest, just cut it down. It can make more productive uh, land out of that. Then, you know, he has his cows. His cows uh, are rotationally grazed. So he constantly is moving them around so that the grass has time to regenerate. And then there's all these cow patties out there. After about three days, he lets chickens out where all the cow patties are because that's when the, the maggots are about to be done hatching. So the chickens can pick out all the maggots and they lay eggs in turn and it's a cycle and the rotation continues on. And he does as much as he can on the farm. He kills his chickens on the farm. He can't kill the cows on the farm due to USDA standards. Um, and they even tried to close him down from his chicken thing, saying it's you know not up to standards where your stainless steel walls and all these things, right? That's why I was saying this USDA everything is fit to a large corporation, and uh, it's just crazy how you can look at different systems and the way we do things, and just <laughs> and you just look at the entire system and you're like, this doesn't actually work well. Like it's crazy how you can uh, try to. <laughs> That's one of the biggest takeaways from this book, right? And it's something. I've seen before, but it's just crazy to think about how much of our society we can build around something that doesn't even make sense. And then you create it when you start with something that doesn't make sense, right? Like trying to take this reductionist approach, then you have more and more problems that you run into. And it's like, you just keep adding it and making it more and more fragile, right? Like, oh, or like big organic, like I said, like their chickens are so susceptible to getting sick because Yes, they don't have all this antibiotics and things like that, but they're not raised in the way a chicken is meant to live, right? They're just raised as the product of the chicken. And it's really funny because Joel Selton will talk about like the chickenness of the chicken and live it, letting the chicken be the most uh, chicken like it can be. So that is the third meal. And then he, after that, he goes into a lot of ideas about like, well, should we be vegetarian after like reading about all this and it's really interesting uh, to read some of his perspectives on it. It's like, you know, if you let the chicken live the life of the chicken like Joel Salton, is it really that bad if it dies in the end? Because some of these domesticated animals, uh, well, they're domesticated, right? They exic they co they've learned to adapt, and their evolutionary adaptation is that they work with humans to protect them, right? It's just kind of interesting like that. Like the same thing with corn. Like, you know, we could say we're using corn, but at the same time, maybe corn has like succeeded through us. It's become like the most planted crop in the world. And is that corn's goal? So it's just kind of interesting things like think of things like that. And, you know, you definitely could, I think you have a great argument um, to be vegetarian looking at, you know, the way that they're processed industrially and the way that they live their lives. They certainly don't get to live the life of a chicken or a cow, they don't get to experience the chickenness of a chicken, right? But if you have a good locally sourced um, farm or something like that, it could be. And another thing is, 
this is in the book, but I was just really, if anyone knows a directory of like local pl- farms and things like that that raise their animals sustainably, I mean, it'd be great. If not, you know, it'd be a great thing to see eventually come in. I was even thinking like, you know, someone just like myself could gather a bunch of information and do something like that. And then the last meal is the forager. Um, uh, one thing about this book, it's pretty verbose. Like th- this guy likes to, you know, tell a story, elaborate, give several <laughs> perspectives. So it, you know, it's like a 400 page book here. Um, but the foraging part, I mean, it's just a lot of his reflections on how we we are originally connected and what it's like to hunt, what it's like to, you know, look for forage for food, gather things and that type of connection that we have. Uh, it's a really interesting book overall because I think everyone knows we've lost a lot of touch of what our food is and what our food means. Another interesting thing too is that we have some of the cheapest food prices ever in history. And so I think we're partially not used to paying for quality in our food anymore and are paying more for our food out of what we make. But historically, we're at lows. So when people say that they, you know, they can't afford this option or that option, um, it might be true to other factors, but just historically, if you look, people just aren't used to paying as much there for food. And when you have a more expensive option, could you cut other things out of your life? Like, how important do you value food at the end of the day? Um, I think it's an important thing to consider as well, because I, I know a lot of people say you can't, you know, it's too expensive to eat healthy, but I don't know. I, I feel like if if you have the ability to at least afford food and other things, you could potentially cut some of the other things before you start in taking food that's not good. The problem with food is you don't see any of the effects, right? It's kind of mysterious. When you ingest things, you're not really clear, you know, how this is going to affect you in 20 years. And all nutritional studies are extremely just difficult to, to follow and figure out what's going on because there's so many factors in each person's life. But back to what I was saying is, yeah, the, it kind of, it's a matter of priority. And as humans, you know, food should be up there on our priority list on our spending list of things we're willing to sacrifice more for. And I think that has been overlooked as well. The true cost of what it is. I mean, if you're out here eating chicken and beef every day, yeah, you should have to pay. You should realize that that's more expensive, right? I mean, if you were to raise cows, you it, it would be so much, it would be so much work. And the cost of that has been totally subsidized by our systems of production. So, I think there's a good case that, you know, if you have, we're used to spending less money on food and that I think it comes down to all of us individually willing to pay more for quality, realizing the importance of food in our life. That's kind of my own takeaway from this book. He doesn't, you know, talk about that stuff too much, but, you know, personally for me, I think it, I already have tried to, you know, look at things, but it's kind of difficult, right, living if you live in a city or something like that to figure out where you can get the fresh products at and, you know, because you can support organic, but like he was saying in the in the book, sometimes it doesn't make so much sense like when you get, a, you know, uh, an asparagus, organic asparagus from halfway across the world. Also eating in seasons and like that thing like too, I, 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 something I'm definitely going to look more into in this book. All right, this is a really long review, but there's a lot of important ideas here that apply to all our lives, right? This food, it's its one of the most important things. The omnivore's dilemma, what do we eat? As an omnivore, we put a lot of attention and focus and energy on selecting our foods. So, great book. I really recommend it. I think the ideas are great to reflect on. I hope you all enjoy this video, and I'll see you all next time.